team saying that we can't just let that pass. GCG gave us a charge, amen, to speak. Do you decree that you believe what God has for you today? Well, speak it out loud, saints. If you've been waiting for a healing, you better say, in the name of Jesus, I claim my healing. If you've been waiting to get out of financial distress, you claim it in the name of Jesus, Lord, you will get me out of this bondage. If you've been looking for some hope with your family, you speak it aloud. Let the Lord know you claim it, your victory in your life. God is good, saints, and he's always speaking out loud. Say it. That the Lord would hear it. Sometimes we think it, but we need to say it. God is so good, saints. Thank you so much, GCG. Speak into the atmosphere. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That was a powerful, powerful song. All the songs today were fantastic. We just thank God. Wow, I got to get back focused on what I'm supposed to be doing up here. <laughs> I'm so focused on speaking into the atmosphere. <laughs> but you are, I, there's no sermon outline for us to follow, but you do have the sermon title today. So what is the title of today's message? Daughters of Thunder, celebrating women's history. Now, I think a couple weeks ago, Pastor Rick preached a message about Black History Month. A powerful message. How many of y'all remember that message? It's a good message. Then last week, we were able to celebrate the pastor's 24th anniversary. Amen? And they wanted to be sure to say thank you to all of you for all of your gifts, your kind words, just being here with them to celebrate 24 years. And while they were speaking last week, wasn't it nice to just kind of reflect back on some of the history that we have had together. I remember my sister after the sermon, she was telling Pastor Gia, yeah, I remember painting walls over in that little alcove, and she was the one of the ones who could not paint. And so <laughs> Pastor Rick told her, you stay in that little spot right there. <laughs> so we've looked at black history, we've looked at our church, our pastor's history, and today we're gonna look a little bit at women's history. How many of y'all know that March is the month of women's history? Oh, wow. Well, not as many here as <laughs> in the first service. But March is Women's History Month. And March 8th is actually International Women's Day, where we celebrate that women have made a contribution to our world. And so today we're going to be speaking a lot about women and the impact that women have and looking at women in the Bible. So before we go one step forward, let's take a moment to pray. Gracious God. We thank you that you are so ready to open our eyes because you know clearly that there is much that we cannot see that we need to see. We thank you, Lord, that you're trying desperately to open our ears because you are always speaking to us. And we pray today, Lord Holy Spirit, that you would open our hearts to receive what you have to say, the plan that you have for our lives. And we thank you and we glorify your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And the people of God said, Amen and amen. Thank you. <laughs> All right, saying So Women's History Month. When I was preparing for this message, and I was trying to find a statement that kind of would describe women's history for me at this time in my life. And I found this statement this, in a magazine that this woman had wrote it written it. So I'm just going to read it to you all because it, it kind of says a lot about women's history. She begins by saying, we can do it. Can't we? Our generation tried. We really did. You see, we embraced education, careers, prominence. We despised all relationships and responsibilities that would hold us back. We moved marriage and mothering and homemaking from the top of our list all the way to the bottom. Or sometimes we cross them off altogether. After all, we were so much more enlightened than our four sisters were. The world had revolved around men, but now it was our turn. We would make it bow down to our demands. So we traded June Cleaver 
for Carrie Bradshaw. We decided that the role of a housewife was totally passe. You see, Charlie's Angels seem so much more exciting. So we redefined boundaries. We changed the rules of the male-female relationship. We became loud, demanding, and aggressive. We boldly pushed back against any traditional definitions of gender and sexuality. We claimed our freedoms. We traded in the Leave it to Beaver model of womanhood, and we adopted the Sex in the City one. We brought into the feminist, we bought into the feminist promise that woman would find happiness and fulfillment when she defined her own identity. And she would find happiness when she decided for herself what life as a woman was really all about. But how very wrong we were. You see, for ultimately our identity as a matter decided not by us, but by the one who in the beginning created us, male and female. You see, saints, in many ways, males and females, we've got it all wrong. When we set out in this world, when God put male and females down here in the beginning, he, sought out, he had a plan for each and every one of us. And we always try to kind of tweak that plan and make it fit our own needs. But in our trying to define ourselves by our relationship to one another, we've gotten it all wrong. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. You see, because from the very beginning of time, when God spoke words and spoke creation into being, he said that he was creating mankind or humankind. And he said, I am creating male and female in my image. And when he said that, that kind of means something that when God decided to create men and women, he just didn't say, the males are in my image and the females are in the image of somebody else. He said, I'm creating them both in my image. And that means something. I get excited about that. I'm like, wow, how is God in the image? The males are the image of God, but yet the females are also the image of God. We are both the image of God. So it is God who decides, amen. It's God who decides what we are all about, not us. <laughs> Thank God for that. So we are going to begin today by asking the question, why did God even create males and females? Why did he want us upon this earth? Now, I know, saints, that many of us, some of y'all going to sleep on me already. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> Patrice already told me. I had to put her business on the street. She said, Pastor Kelly, I was so bored, I just laid down and went to sleep. <laughs> and I said, Patrice, I promise I'm going to try to make it better second service. Don't go to sleep on me. <laughs> and she said, okay. And she said to me right before service, Pastor Kelly, I'm trying not to go to sleep. <laughs> Look, kids keep it real. <laughs> they say the things we want to say. <laughs> I'm appreciating Patrice. <laughs> At least she told me the truth. <laughs> So I know, you know, every topic isn't an exciting topic and it doesn't apply to each and every one of us. But tell your neighbor, wake up. <laughs> this is the afternoon service. <laughs> and the 830 service, we, they got a little bit more grace because I'm just as tired as they are. <laughs> but this is my hour. I'm wide awake about this time of day. <laughs> so wake up. So we got to ask ourselves the question, why did God create males and females? You see, because when we look at the standards of the world, the world would give us the impression that God made men to lord, lord over women. So we have to ask ourselves, Lord, did you make men so that they could come down to earth and say, hey, all you women, I'm going to tell you what to do today. Did you make men so that they can tell women, you don't get to go to school, you don't get to have an education, you don't get to work, all you can do is stay home and have babies. <laughs> did you make men so that men can come down on this earth and say all women must submit to me you know I was looking in the Bible for that one <laughs> when God created males did he want them to come down to earth and see women as the only source of pleasure for them did God make men to say you can use sex any way you feel like using sex and women are here solely for you 
You know, saints, I just don't think God said any of those things. <laughs> as much as some males might want to think that, <laughs> I don't think God said that. But we also have to ask the question, why did God send us here females onto the earth? Did God send females down for us to act submissive so that we can pretend that God did not give us these beautiful brains and we can set them on the tables beside us and act as if we don't know anything? Did God send us down to this earth so that males could completely dominate us and we can sit like, okay, whatever you want us to do, we'll do it. <laughs> Did God send us down on this earth to argue back and be defensive with males all the time, snapping our necks in our heads? I don't, don't say, mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know some women think they got a God given talent, but <laughs> we can tell that just by us laughing that we know that God did not send us down here for those purposes. God never sent us down to dominate each other. He gave us dominion over the earth and the animals, but not each other. But the reality is, saints, that this leave it to beaver model truly existed at one time in our world, and it still exists right now for many women. You see, there are women who believe that they are preferred to be in the home, sitting down, having children, and not using their God-given abilities instead of going out into the world and making a difference for Christ. So we're going to look today at what the biblical model says about women. What does God really say about us? And I have to be honest, saying sometimes it's hard to look in the Bible to ask that question. Because sometimes people use the scripture in the Bible against women. You know that scripture, you know, in the Bible it says in Genesis that God created women to help men, right? So I just don't understand how the definition of help became you can't get an education, you can't work, you can't say anything, you, you can't have an opinion. But some kind of way, people turn it around. And then we have that interpretation in the Bible, that scripture that says, wives, submit to your husbands. Oh, y'all, I do not like that verse in the Bible. <laughs> wives, submit. It would be nice if we could just get rid of everything in the Bible we don't like. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> we could just get rid of those parts that don't add up to our lives. You know that scripture, bash the children's head against the rocks. <laughs> it doesn't add up all the time, does it? <laughs> well, unless you're a parent about to hit your kid, it doesn't add up. <laughs> but some scriptures are in the Bible for a particular reason not to be used against us or to be manipulated and to hold some people down, but to truly understand what does God mean when he says help and submit. You see, saints, we're going to be looking at some Bible stories of women and when they walked along this road of helping people and being submissive toward people. And we're going to find out some new elements of the stories that we may not have looked at before. You see, our Old Testament story is from the book of Ruth. All of you all are familiar with Ruth? Okay, Ruth was the one. She was the daughter-in-law of Naomi. And the book of Ruth is named Ruth, but in reality, it should be named Naomi because Naomi is really the central character to this book. And so Naomi is a woman who we can imagine at one time was probably a young girl. And she was growing up in this time where she would have to grow up to become a future wife and a mother. And so here she is. She's just like a lot of us. We're following the line, the things that are expected of us to do. So, so Naomi grows up. She gets married to Elimelech, and then she goes, and they have two sons. Now, they are living at a time during Israel where they experience a severe drought. It's kind of like what we're experiencing right now. The economy has dried up, and there's no money. Anybody feeling that drought right now? <laughs> So they are experiencing this, this serious drought. And her husband says, I think, Naomi, we might need to move to a better land. It might be some opportunity somewhere else for us. So, you know, Naomi goes along. She doesn't question. Scripture doesn't tell us what her opinion was. But they move. They go all the way to this new country with their two sons, and they get established. Well, lo and behold, while they're there, Naomi's husband dies. Now, that's pretty different, isn't it? Her, her husband died. 
Then right after the husband dies, the two sons go and get married. But they didn't marry Israelite women. They just got married to two women that lived in the region. Then soon after they get married, her two sons die. Talk about a time of suffering. Anyone ever experienced suffering quite like that? Where event after event after event keeps happening in your life. And you're like, wow, Lord, why me? I think Naomi may have been the original Job. Here she is. She's losing everything. And she has her two sons-in-law, her two daughters-in-laws left with her. But I want to talk about some aspects of the story, saints, that are right there in the story, but maybe we don't necessarily pay attention to them. You see, God always planned for women to use their minds. There was never a time when God gave us permission to stop using our brains. He always invested into us knowledge and wisdom, and he wanted us to use that knowledge and wisdom. And we can see that in the fact that the first thing that we can acknowledge in, in this story of Naomi is that the women outlive the men. <laughs> Do you all catch that? The women lived longer than the men. The men died first. And so when we think about how women sometimes can enwrap their lives around a man's needs, you can see how that's not a good idea because he may die before you. So you see, when we get to the point in our lives when we tell a man, look, you write all the checks, you pay all the bills, you put all the insurance in your name, you do everything for the house and the cars, that's not a good idea, is it? Anyone that's a widow would know that as soon as he is gone, all that responsibility falls upon you. So in the, in the marriage time, it's a good time to form a partnership so that everybody knows how to pay the bills. Everybody knows what's on the house note and every single paperwork in the house. You see, because those women outlive their men. And so that means they had to use that brain power that God had given to them because guess what? When the men died, they had to go there forth and plan some funerals. Anybody ever plan a funeral? It's a little bit complicated, isn't it? It's a little bit challenging, isn't it? You actually need to think some things through. Even in the midst of your grief, you need to have some knowledge and wisdom to understand what all those paperwork is telling you and all those little dotted lines they want you to sign on. You see, women using their brains is one of the best ways to be able to help any man in this world. <laughs> You see, these women, once they did those funerals, they then had to decide that they were going back to Israel. They had to navigate the terrain to get from where they were to where God was calling them back home. Now, think about this, saints. We've all seen pictures of Israel back in the day. Did you ever see any signs that says, go this way? It's just like dirt and rocks in the desert, isn't it? I always wonder how in the world do they know that if they go along this path, they're going to get to a town suddenly. You see, they did not have GPS systems. They didn't have a map laid out in front of them. Those women had to have some knowledge in order to understand how to get where God was calling them to be. So knowledge and wisdom are important in this aspect of understanding what God created us to be. God gave us each some things that were exactly the same and some things that were completely different. Notice, he gave us all a brain. He gave us all a heart. He gave us lungs so we can breathe. And without those things, saints, we cannot function. We cannot be who God created us to be. So from the very beginning of the time, when God said, I'm creating Adam and Eve, he knew that they were going to always need each other. You see, the Bible says from the beginning that when God created Adam, Adam was going to need some help. Amen. I'm sorry, men. I don't know why God felt you needed some help, but he knew you was going to need some help. I don't know why it says in the scripture that women should submit and you all need some help. I don't know, but it's there. <laughs> So we just got to work with it. We can't get rid of it, right? So we knew from the very beginning that the men were going to need some help. But one of the best ways to help somebody is by using all of your gifts and talents. Not just some of them, all of them. 
You see, one thing that women often do today is we try to dumb down. Anybody ever heard of dumbing down? <laughs> that means you try to act dumber than you really are so that the guy that you're trying to impress will think, you know, he got some value or something. He feels better about himself. I don't know because I've dumbed down before sometimes. We go completely dumb. Oh, I don't know how to put that light bulb in. <laughs> I just, oh, how do, you, how do you put the gas in the car again? Can you show me? <laughs> I don't know. It is more beneficial to men if we stop dumbing down and we actually admit what we truly do know and actually offer some real help. You see, let's think about it. If all of us had to go outside and build our own house today, wouldn't you want somebody that could really help you? I mean, if you didn't have a carpenter, you had to do this on your own, wouldn't you want somebody to help you who knew how to, you know, put up some drywall, put the electrical wires in, put the plumbing in, turn the heat on? You see, if, if somebody came in the room, and, and I love when you, sometimes you go to hospitals or something like that, and the patient will say, oh, no, that's a woman. I don't want her to help me. And I'm thinking, man, you about to die. You got about 10 minutes. And you worried about somebody, a male or a female? <laughs> wow. I don't care who give me mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Just don't let me die. <laughs> Sometimes we need help. And if somebody was coming along to, that can offer some real true help, you would not want them to take that moment to dumb down on you. You're like, it's snowing outside, it's raining, we got to get this house built, and you acting like you don't know how to screw in a light bulb. <laughs> would you come on? <laughs> you see, from the very beginning, when Adam and Eve were originally put in the garden, he put them there with knowledge and wisdom. Didn't say, you know, let me tell Adam how to plant a tree and make sure the apples are doing okay, or let me tell Eve, Eve what to do with the oranges. God gave them the knowledge. <laughs> Apparently they knew. Now, you know, saints, I'm the kind of person that I like to tell people one time how to do it, that I'm going to go do my part, and you go do your part. <laughs> so if Adam and Eve is in the garden, and Adam's over here pruning the apple tree, and Eve keep, Adam, I need some help. I can't figure out these oranges. <laughs> he might be like, okay, I'm going to come help you one time. But after they like, look, you got to do your part in the garden. <laughs> Let me do my part and you do your part. Both of them had God-given knowledge. And when we use that knowledge, we help other people. When Pastor Rick was preaching his sermon about Black History Month, he asked you all a question. He said, if you knew something, and by knowing that something, it would save you time, energy, and money, would you utilize that something, that knowledge that you had? You all answered yes. Well, if you knew that a woman had the knowledge that you needed to build your house, help you with your car, help save your life, would you use that knowledge? Amen. I think we would all use that knowledge because when we don't use that knowledge, it costs us a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a whole lot of money. So all of us, we can agree that God gave us all knowledge and wisdom to help each other. Then in our New Testament reading, we can see some more abilities that God gave to women. You see, the New Testament reading is about a woman from Canaan, and she is a Gentile. That meant she was not an Israelite, so she was not amongst the chosen people. So here she is. She has a daughter that is possessed by an evil spirit. Now, at no time should she be coming and talking to the Israelite men. They completely separated themselves. But here comes a day when Jesus and the disciples are walking along, this Gentile woman sees in the crowd, and she said, hold on. There's something special about that one right there. And she calls out, she says, Jesus, son of David, heal my daughter. Now, saints, I want you to know that at this time, nobody had really recognized who Jesus was. Here is this Gentile woman. She is not even a part of the faith, and she understands when she's in the presence of the Messiah. You see, that is only a gift given by God to know when you are in the presence of the Messiah. So this woman is standing there, and she sees Jesus and says, Hey, son of David, 
I'm recognizing that you are the Messiah and you can heal my daughter. Now, saints, I don't know about you. I don't know how that woman thought about her daughter and what made her think that her daughter was possessed by an evil spirit. But after being around a few children in my life, I can have some times when we think, you know, they might be possessed. (laughs) And some kids who think y'all possessed. I'm not going to say my name. (laughs) But it's some times in your house when you're wondering, like, do people's head turn around? (laughs) Start spitting out green goo or something? (laughs) Oh, do I know TJ? (laughs) Yeah, he ain't got what tears. They together. <laughs> so we know it sometimes when our children have some special extra abilities that they should not have. And so that's why I believe God gives the gift of discernment and recognition to women. You see, how is it that your mama always could know something? She always knew. Your daddy might not have known, but your mama did. She'd be like, what's going on with you? What you up to? You say, nothing, ma, not, nothing. I'm good, nothing. Uh-huh, we just wait. We just wait. <laughs> you see, I think that recognition and discernment of evil came by the way of Eve. You see, Eve was the first woman who experienced Satan. And it's that Satan, that's that statement that says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, I think Eve must have said, we're going to pass this down to the women. They're going to recognize evil as soon as they come in the room. (laughs) You see, we call discernment or recognition, we call it a woman's intuition or a mother's intuition. But some kind of way, we know when something ain't right. We know when we need the power of Jesus in our homes to claim back our children or whoever it else may be that's in our lives. And that gift comes from God. You see, this woman had this power. She's looking at her daughter like, oh, no, we can't have this in the house. She looked out. She saw Jesus. She started calling on Jesus. Look, Jesus, my daughter is in need, and only you can heal her today. You see, saints, it was important to understand that this woman's faith, this woman's belief is what carried her through a hard time in her life. Just like with Naomi and the the sisters-in-law, it was their faith, their trust in God that carried them through. And how many situations, women, have we had to be carried through sometimes in our lives? How many times when we have felt like we was in the deepest, darkest pit that we could ever be, be in, and only God brought us out of that pit? Only God and our faith and our Lord. You see, when this woman was calling out to Jesus, the disciples tried to shut her up. They was like, you need to go on away from here. You're not supposed to be here. And she just kept calling out, no, I know where my help is at. And sometimes we give up too easily. We cry out the first time we don't get no help. We walk right on the way. I give up. But we need to keep calling out. Jesus, help me. Jesus, help my kids. Jesus, help my husband. Help my co-workers. Help everybody around me and help me too. (laughs) You see, this woman had this persistent faith. Say persistent faith. That even though the disciples, the men tried to get rid of her and Jesus didn't answer her the first time she said something, She did not give up on believing in the miracle that God had for her life and the miracle that God had for her daughter. She said, oh, no, Jesus is going to heal my daughter. That's why that song that GCG was so important today, saints. Do you claim your blessing? Do you keep saying it? Oh, no, Jesus, you are going to heal me. Jesus, you are going to fix my family. Jesus, you are going to help me with my relationships. We say it one time and think we good. (laughs) Sometimes we got to keep saying it over and over and over again, just like that woman did. This woman had a persistent faith that said, God is still on the throne. No matter what's happening with my kids, I'm going to keep bringing them to God in prayer. 
and we all need to do that, males and females. Another thing that this woman had was that she had a voice. She yelled aloud above the men in the room, above the other people in the room, and she just would not let her voice be silenced. How many times, women, have you allowed your voice to be silenced? You see something, you know something, you feel it in your heart, and you go like this, and just keep quiet. But I was thinking about something, saints, when I was thinking about my sermon title, Whenever God's voice is described in the Bible, it's described loudly. It's described like thunder. You know, something that makes you stop and look like, whoa, what was that? God's voice. I mean, sometimes we hear God's voice like that simple, quiet whisper. But a lot of times we hear God saying, hey, down there, what are you all doing? And here we are, we quiet our voices. Instead of speaking up loud and saying, this is an injustice, this is wrong, we quiet our voices. But saints, when you think about it, God's voice is described as thunder. We are like daughters of thunder. We need our voices to speak up loudly. Because although women have come a long way, we still got a whole long way to go. Some women are enjoying quite a lot of freedom right now, but too many women are still in bondage. Too many still don't know how to read and write. I can't imagine. Reading is my favorite thing in the whole wide world. I love to read. And for somebody to say, you can't read this book because you are a girl, simply because of my gender. Saints, folks had this happen. We are experiencing the result of labor from women saying, no, we want our daughters to be able to read and write. Who will we speak up for? Whose voice will we advocate for? When I'm thinking about these slaves in Sudan, you better believe a whole good group of them are women. Some of them are little girls. I was reading some news stories about in Afghanistan, they opened a school for girls. Somebody threw a grenade in the school on the very first day of school, and they killed 100 girls. For what? Because they want to learn how to read and write? Saints, I just cannot believe it. And there's so many, that little girl, Malala, we all the teenagers, she got shot in her face because she wanted an education. And this is the world we live in, but we don't speak out when those things happen. Did anybody write a letter? Did anybody send a note? Did anybody make a phone call? We sat and looked at our televisions and we turned them off and we walked another way. Our voice was quieted. But we are to speak boldly, saints. It is not too late to speak up when we see injustice. And so the second thing, we know that the woman had persistent faith and now she has a voice. And what else? does the passage say about this woman? This woman was able to worship God wherever she was at. You see, this story tells us that while this woman was here and the disciples were shooing her way and she was asking for help with her daughter, that she got on her knees, saints. Imagine where she's at. It's a group full of men. They're all looking at her like, what is she doing down there on the floor? And she gets down in the middle of all of this, and she begins to worship. Just pour herself out to Jesus. Now I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to ask you all, who's willing to worship? You see, we come to church. We praise. We get our song on. We fellowship. We smile. We, you know, we pat each other on the back. But do we worship? Do we ever get to the point where we say, I don't care who's looking at me. I am driven to my knees, and I'm going to get on my knees. I need to put my hands up in honor of God. That type of worship where it doesn't matter who's around you and what the other persons are thinking. You see, saints, how we can truly help each other another way is that we truly start worshiping, truly start taking our relationship with God seriously. That's what we spent those days in insanity for, so we can know 
who God is, know who we are, and then as a result, we can worship that God. There are many women in the Bible who were just not embarrassed at all to worship God. If we think about the woman with the alabaster box, she came in and she anointed Jesus and she did not care who was around her or what they were doing. She worshiped Jesus. Worshiped. And I think about that when you think about the terms help and submit. You see, because I think we get submission confused with I can tell you what to do and how to do it and when to do it. But if we think about how this woman submitted herself to Jesus, and she just bowed down and said, I respect you. I know who you are. I believe in you. That's what submission is about. Submission is not about me bowing down to my husband or my husband bowing down to me. It's about both of us bowing down to Jesus. You see, because if you read that whole scripture about submission, it starts with the fact that we all submit to Jesus, that Jesus is our head. How can we help each other in this world? How can we submit to each other in this world? Well, saints, we have to know something. That's education. We all have to start truly worshiping God like God deserves to be worshiped. It's time to speak up against injustice. And another thing we can stop doing is defining each other by our standards. Who are we to tell each other what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to think and what we're supposed to believe? Only God has that ability to define who we are. You see, saints, is the saying it. I keep hearing it. Even in 2013, people still say, oh, that's a woman's job or that's a man's job. And I'm thinking, hmm, God gave me these hands. He gave me these arms, gave me this back. <laughs> I can lift some things. <laughs> he gave you all hands and feet. <laughs> I, I didn't see him when he said in the garden, do the work. He didn't label, this is Adam's job over here, and this is Eve's job <laughs> over here. He told them all to do the work. Amen. There is no such thing as this is your job and this is my job. It's all of our job. Another thing that we can do is we can stop telling each other what we can, cannot do. We are so good at saying, you can't do that. You can't do that. Why don't we start telling each other what we can do? We can all go to school. We can all work hard. We can all get jobs. We can all speak up against each other and injustice. We can do these things. But why would we want to do it all? You see, God told us in his book, he said, I have a plan and a purpose for each one of your lives. He didn't just say, I have a plan for the men and a separate plan for the women. He said, I have a plan and a purpose for each and every one of your lives. And he said, that plan includes a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. A plan to give you a hope and a future. You see, last week when we learned about our church history and Pastor Rick and Pastor Toby was telling us about all the beautiful things that we have done as a church. I thought about, wow, God let us all do that. But what is it he's asking us to do now? God is saying, Glenville, I have a mission for you now. It might require you to be a little uncomfortable at times. It might require you to do some things in front of people that you never have done before. It might require you to send some offerings way over to a different country in Sudan to people you don't even know. But he has a plan for us, saints. And the only way we can all be a part of that plan and really fulfill that plan if we all Decide to help each other and to submit to God. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gracious God, you are so mighty and so amazing. And we as humans, we confess that we just keep getting it all wrong. We keep getting in your way, Lord Jesus, and keep trying to tell each other how to do stuff instead of truly listening to how you want us to do stuff, Lord Jesus. So we ask your forgiveness upon us now, Holy Spirit, and we pray, Lord, that we will start looking at each other through your eyes, that we will see that you created us all to be here together, to help each other, to help you, and most of all, to submit to you, Lord Jesus. So we thank you for this day, and we thank you for how you blessed us in our hearts. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. 
and the people of God said, amen and amen.